So in the uh, previous session, Chris started off by uh, apologizing for Donald Trump. With three British speakers, I better apologize immediately for Brexit. Um, <laughs> but uh, my, my talk won't be anything about Brexit. So, uh, In fact, I'm going to be talking about streets and the importance of streets um, and how streets drive much of the sort of mix, use, dynamism of, uh, of cities which is so important also to SMEs. And I'm going to use the London as the sort of case study to illustrate my argument based on research that I've done. Um, but I think the arguments apply to, well, many, many cities around the world. So our mixed streets, in the UK we call them our high streets, um, very much capture the excitement and the dynamism of our cities, of our, of our urban areas. They're places of great contrast, but also great variety. Uh, in the UK, at least, they're the responsibility of many, but often pretty much ignored by uh, society and by the powers that be. They're let, left to get on with their own thing. Sometimes we have a rather idyllic view of these local high streets, in the US they're called main streets. Uh, this is a, a, a view from uh, 1911, Putney High Street, one of the high streets in London, a very civilized looking place where people go to do their shoppings and, uh, shopping and to parade up and down, not too much traffic. This is the same high street today, um, much more choked with traffic and pollution and so forth, a very different sort of place, but still a very dynamic uh, place full of life and activity. Very much when we look at these streets in a city like London, we see a tale of two cities. Some of them are really thriving. If you go to uh, central London and look at some of these mixed urban streets, they're full of life and activity and vibrancy and seem to be doing very well. Others, particularly in the more suburban areas of London, are struggling, at least on the face of it, uh, with a lot of vacancies, shops closing down and so forth. And the sort of shops that we see in those, uh, uh, on those streets have changed in recent years. We have a lot of betting shops, a lot of fast food establishments and so forth. So they've changed. And that, in the literature, you see two contrasting narratives of these streets. One narrative says they're congested and polluted and deprived and dilapidated and inefficient and dirty and ugly. The other, by contrast, says that they're places of vibrancy and inclusive and still loved and full of character and diverse, familiar, and so forth. So two quite contrasting narratives within the literature on these streets. So what's the real story? Well, this is what our research uh, set to uh, investigate. Um, we used a range of methods, but the key thing to point out is that we looked at the city as a whole, London as a whole, uh, and we looked very much at streets from the bottom up as well. So we tried to look at it across those different scales to really understand what is the story of these streets uh, in London. Where are these mixed high streets, these mixed urban streets? Well, if you look at something like the London Plan, then you wouldn't think there was any streets at all. You would think, actually, it's a bunch of blobs on the map, little round circles, which denotes the town centres. They don't see the city at all in terms of actual, uh, of actual streets uh, in any way. They're a bunch of blobs and triangles and, and, and so forth. If you look at the famous A to Z map uh, of London, and you look at all the streets named High Street or High Road, then there's 113 of these throughout Greater London, uh, excluding uh, the central activity zone. But that's not the whole story, because if you then start to map, in fact, continuous uh, retail of at least 250 metres in length, then what you see is there are 702 lengths of this mixed urban street uh, in London. Uh, about 700 metres in length on average, and about 500 kilometres in total across the city, outside of that central activity zone. And that's the area that we were looking at in this research. We weren't looking at the area in the central activity zone, the city of London, Westminster, and so forth. 
What they are is continuous, connective, largely unremarkable, pretty everyday sort of streets, mixed streets, that nevertheless bind the city together. Many have a very long history, dating back 2,000 years to the sort of Roman evolution of, of the city, and you can still trace those roots today in some of these mixed uh, urban streets. But they're sites of rapid change, and they've continued to change over the centuries and over the decades, and they continue to change today, not least uh, in terms of the retail and the, the types of retail that they support. And that's very much what you see as you walk up and down these streets, of course. The key point to make, and at the heart of the argument I wish to make, is that these are actually truly mixed spaces, truly mixed streets. Within the case studies that we looked at, and we did some very detailed case study work, we found that there was a proportion of two to two to one retail, office, industrial uses on these streets. So we think of them as just retail. We think of them as town centers. That's where our planners make the mistake, because they're not. They include retail, but that's just part of the functions that these places have. So there's this proportion within 200 meters. That's a block depth of these streets in London, two to two to one. Retail, office, industrial. Industrial being a whole bunch of things, small scale making to food preparation and manufacture and so forth. They also have an, incredibly, an, an incredible diversity of morphology. That's the urban form. I don't really have time to discuss this, but just suffice to say that they are very diverse. But what unites them is that what you generally see is this thin crust of mixed use flowing through the city. Uh, this 200 meter depth crust that goes along these streets, uh, threading their way through the city. And that's very characteristic of these mixed urban streets. This is, in a way, the critical diagram. Part of our methodology was to draw these streets. And what you see when you start to draw them is that the retail uh, along the ground floor frontage is only a small part of what makes up these streets. The really interesting bit is behind. It's that hinterland behind the streets where all this mix of activities really is. And that's where all those SMEs are, as well as in the shop units themselves, uh, a, a place where office and industrial and all sorts of uses thrive. But it's really understood, it's really looked at as a sort of living, working, operating ecosystem. Together, they represent 3.6% of London's road network, so quite a small proportion of the road uh, uh, network in London. But 1.5 million Londoners work on these streets within that 200 meter zone of those streets. That is more people working on those streets than work in the central activity zone, in the city of London, in Westminster, and in those uh, areas in the center of London. More people work. And what's more, there's about twice the number of businesses located on these streets outside the central activity zone than are located within the central activity zone themselves. They're an incredibly diverse, ecology of uses and activities and businesses, many of which are small or medium-sized businesses. The number of employees on average in the cases that we looked at is just 8.5 employees in those businesses working on uh, and in and just immediately behind the streets. Sites of great innovation, competitiveness, and local sustainability because they're local businesses investing in the local area. Uh, the wages they pay tend to go to people who live locally and work locally and shop locally and so forth. They're also places of great familiarity. They're places that we know and enjoy. But we go there and we use these, these streets for a whole variety of activities. Often the planners think we just go there to shop. We found that only a third of trips to these mixed streets are for uh, specifically for shopping. There's a whole range of social and entertainment and work-based activities and cultural activities that are also located there as well. 
They're also part of a sustainable movement framework because it's on those streets that the buses move. It's where the tubes, uh, where you go to catch the tube. So they're part of, an, of, of a long-established, very sustainable movement framework. Only a fifth of people go to those streets by car in London. But there are, of course, some unfortunate side effects. Not least, pollution. They are the most polluted streets, the most polluted places uh, in London, with nitrogen uh, dioxide rates and particulates well above safe limits, generally. Now, that may, may change in the future as, as technologies come along uh, uh, to change that situation. But at the moment, they are highly polluted places. They're also the places where there's most development potential in London. Funnily enough, um, over half of London's brownfield sites are within a two-minute walk of those high streets. And this was the whole reason we started off doing this research, because the Greater London Authority were interested in whether there was any development potential within these, uh, in, in, you know, next to uh, these uh, high streets. What you tend to find is it's quite small. It's the more difficult to develop sites which tend to be located there. And therefore, often the sites that are not recognized or tend to be ignored in our planning strategies. They also represent, of course, substantial sunk investments. Some of these streets have been around for 2,000 years. We've been investing in them all that time. It makes sense to use them and utilize them in the future planning and strategization for uh, the city. And their places, their streets that all Londoners have a stake in. Two-thirds of Londoners live within a five-minute walk of one of these mixed, vibrant, local high streets. That's five million people. But whilst they're resilient and have been resilient through the centuries, they are streets that on the face of it have been suffering recently, particularly in terms of their retail function. And that is something we need to bear in mind. So what are we doing to exploit the potential and address some of the challenges of these sorts of streets in London? Well. We're not doing a lot, I have to say, apart from writing a lot of reports, um, which is very good for consultants. Um, this is just a few of the reports that have been written, um, many of which say much of the same thing. Uh, so we're not doing a lot. My clickers stopped working. <laughs> I said we weren't doing much. Oh, there we are. Uh, what, what's national policy saying uh, about these issues? Well, the government have tried to uh, deregulate uh, some of the regulations around the different types of uses that can be located or planned for within these streets. Um, and you might think that's a good thing, that you know, over time they should be able to adapt. If we need less retail, then perhaps other uses uh, could uh, be created in these, these locations. But what we're finding in London in particular, that's a little bit dangerous because there's such a shortage of residential accommodation that almost any opportunity is taken to turn almost anything into residential. And the danger is we will lose that sort of fine-grained ecology of uses and all those small and medium-sized businesses which are located there. So this deregulation isn't necessarily the entire answer. What we tend to see is that government nationally and locally has a very crude perspective on these types of streets. They don't really understand what they are. 77% of these streets are outside any designation in our London plan, for example. They, they just don't exist as far as the planners are concerned. And they don't really exist in, in local plans either, where you still get this dots on a map. Uh, and the reality is that the city and our cities are just not like that. They're not shaped like that. They don't work like that. Part of the problem is their complexity. They're both bits of very complex physical fabric. They're also bits of the movement framework, this public transport and, and private transport movement framework in the city. They're bits of complex real estate owned by many, many different players, and they're places of complex social and economic and cultural exchange 
And all of that complexity makes them sort of too difficult to understand, too difficult to handle. There's a couple of silver linings uh, in London uh, in, in recent years. The first is that Transport for London, who deal with uh, many of our roads, particularly the major roads in London, have been on a journey themselves and have come to realise that actually it's worth investing in the public realm of uh, these streets and trying to improve the public realm. And that, in turn, has, has, has a big impact on how they function and, 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 and uh, on the value of those streets. And so that's been important. There's also been a number of funds set up by uh, different mayors of London who have been investing in some of these streets. 70 million, 41 million, 50 million. Sounds like a lot of money. In fact, of course, uh, it's just a drop in the ocean when you compare it to some of the staggering investments that have happened in some large retail malls that have recently opened in London. 1.6 billion in the Westfield Shopping Centre in Shepherd's Bush alone. So... You know, it blows out of the water the tiny little investments that the public sector has been able to make in the traditional streets of the city. What about the future of these streets? Well, as I say, very often they're put in the too difficult to handle category. London's high streets, as I say, account for 3.6% of its road network. They represent some of its most important and potentially sustainable spaces in the city. As I've illustrated through the data, they're sites of huge strategic potential. There's great potential for growth on and around those streets. They're places of huge significance for Londoners. I would argue, and our research argued, that we need to prioritise growth and development strategies around this network of mixed streets but often they languish in this too difficult to handle strategy simply because we don't understand them. We don't understand that complexity that makes up these spaces. And of course, London's not alone. We have these streets all around the world, these mixed urban streets, these fine-grained ecologies that drive so much of the dynamism of our cities and, our, and where many of these small and medium-sized businesses uh, are located. What we need is a more sophisticated view. Our research suggested that we need to see the street as embedded within a hinterland that feeds and shapes the space, whilst the resulting corridor is continuous and connective. So it's about that relationship between the continuous street and its hinterland and understanding how that works. This has depth that spreads beyond this thin retail crust. It's not just about retail. It's a unifying seam instead of a dividing edge. Uh, and it should be a major planning entity in its own right, but often isn't. Often we get this, where just the retail is considered, and we don't get that more sophisticated view of how our streets work and operate. So it's not just about that. It's also about this, it's about the height as well, because there's something above those shop fronts. There's a whole bunch of uses up there, a lot of residential and, and office uses. Not just about that either, it's about that hinterland. It's about what happens in that 200-meter stretch behind the facade, which is so critical to how these different uh, small-scale businesses operate. It's not just this either, it's not just that a uh, bit of small, maybe uh, dominant uh, retail frontage along a small stretch of street, uh, or necessarily that. It's about the hinterland, but it's more than that as well, because it's also uh, about this, because these streets go on for miles and miles. This continuous crust of mixed use, which goes on for miles. Often there's no retail on it, but you still get that cr crust of other uses happening on the, in that 200-meter stretch through the city. So we need a more holistic view. That's what I'm arguing. We need to understand these places as bits of physical fabric, as bits of movement, places of real estate investment, but also this complex series of exchange activities we need a more holistic approach to their management and understanding. We need to see them as places, 
as well as bits of the movement framework and bits of retail. This seems to be going very slowly, my clicker. Ah, there we are. So, there's a number of things that we might think about doing. I think the first and the last of these are clearly critical. We need to prioritize mi these mixed streets as places for public uh, realm investment. Uh, a study that uh, we recently, more recently, uh, just published called Street Appeal, which you can get to at that uh, address there, looked at the value added by investing in the public realm. So if you invest in a higher quality public realm, how does that impact on the, the local businesses in and around the street? And I think there's a very convincing argument that it can have a major impact. But also we need to prioritize those small scale businesses and activities, which many of them ha uh, happen there, they come and go. Some of them have been there for a very long time, but they're not really prioritized very often in the way that we plan and we think about our cities. Um, and we need to make much more of them. We need to understand those ecologies, how we can support them, and how we can create a physical infrastructure that works for them. Ah, there we are. <laughs> So what will they look like in uh, 20 years' time, these mixed streets or even, for, even beyond? Well, will they look like this, all shut up and nobody using them? I hope not. I, 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 I do hope not. Will they look like this? Uh, I, Googled, I Googled the future high street, and this is what came up. The interesting thing is there's no people there, uh, which is a bit worrying. Uh, I hope they're not going to look like that in the future. Perhaps they might look a bit like this. Uh, in other words, a traditional street, but integrating some of these new technologies. That's a very retail-based view of what these streets might be and how we can integrate the new technologies with the traditional street as, as a place. Uh, perhaps we might get, we certainly might get some of that. In a few places we may get this, where the street just ceases to, to operate really, ceases to exist and we all just sort of stay at home and we uh, order things on our computer and, we, and, that, and, and the street has no, no real function. I hope we won't get too much of that. Certainly London, I think, suggests that uh, uh, we won't. It seems to be that the, the streets certainly are a lot more robust than elsewhere around the United Kingdom. Most likely, I think we'll see this in 20 years, 30 years, 40 years' time. In other words, pretty much what we have today, they will remain resilient, they will remain mixed, they will remain vibrant places, and that's because their physical structure allows them to be resilient, it allows them to be very robust, it allows businesses to come and go, whether it's retail or all of these other businesses to come and go over time and has done for centuries, and really we see no prospect in the long term of that substantially changing because the physical structure very much breeds that type of, of mix of activity. And this is certainly an argument that is supported in a recent UN report. Um, streets and public spaces uh, are drivers of urban prosperity. It says those cities that have failed to integrate the multi-functionality of streets tend to have lesser infrastructure development, lower productivity, a poorer quality of life, social exclusion, and generate inequalities in various spheres of life. Uh, including access to basic services in particular. So the UN very much supports this idea that the future development of our cities should be streets-based, should be based on streets, and these mixed, vibrant, high streets will be an important part of that, key drivers of local prosperity. Have I got any more slides? Oh, just one. Say so thank you very much. If you're interested in looking up the research on which this talk has been based, then that's the paper there, Mixed Street Corridors, London Local High Streets. Uh, if you just go to that website, then you can download it free from there. Thank you very much.